welcome back to another Journal of Oncology Practice podcast from ASCO. I'm Dr. Bob Miller from Johns Hopkins and consultant editor at the JOP. Last year, for one of our first podcasts, I spoke with Tom Barr and Elaine Toll from Oncology Metrics about their fifth annual National Practice Benchmark Report, which was published in the September 2010 Journal of Oncology Practice. Well, Tom and Elaine were foolish enough to accept another invitation from me to appear on the JOP podcast this month. This year, I was very interested in speaking with both of them about their highly anticipated 2011 benchmark report. They actually have two different papers coming out this month in JOP on this topic. Their very data-rich manuscript presenting the detailed 2011 report with uh, multiple tables and over 70 graphs and charts has been published online this month and the paper issue will be coming out in November. So please look for that. Where we will focus most of our discussion for this podcast will be on the first manuscript entitled Oncology Practice Trends from the National Practice Benchmark 2005 through 2010. This appears in the September JOP, which is a special issue devoted to the state of oncology practice. But first, let me reintroduce my two guests. Tom Barr is the General Manager of Oncology Metrics, a division of Altos Solutions, which has been conducting these benchmarking surveys of practicing oncologists since 2005. He is past Executive Director of a large oncology practice in Fort Worth and has been very active in multiple organizations involved in oncology practice management, including MGMA and ASCO. It's great to have you back, Tom. Thank you. It's good to be back. Also with us is Elaine Toll from Oncology Metrics, where she is the Director of Consulting Services. Elaine also has extensive experience as an oncology practice manager, and like Tom, she has been heavily involved in MGMA, AOHA, and ASCO, where she is known to many as a speaker at the ASCO annual meeting. And thanks for joining me tonight, Elaine. It is always a pleasure. Thanks, Dr. Miller. So maybe we could start by having you frame the survey instrument and give us a little of the general overview of the data collection for this year. Who is being surveyed and what type of benchmarks did you use? Sure. Uh, It's a pleasure to uh, to chat about that. This is an annual survey, as you know, and it is uh, collecting self-reported data from practices who choose to respond. It's a combination of data elements, both subjective data about their practice structure and and uh, how the practice is organized, as well as objective data elements, number of practitioners, uh, some financial data, productivity data, visit volumes, and those kinds of things. As far as who is being surveyed, really anyone in oncology practice is welcome to participate. We tend to get mostly physician-owned private practices um, because that's how our database is made up. But we are, every year we always get some hospital-based practices as well as a few academic practices that are interested in participating. It's primarily oriented towards medical oncology services, although increasingly we include questions that relate to other components of, of a more multi-specialty medical oncology, pract- or oncology practice such as radiation therapy services, imaging, laboratory, etc. I see. How many uh, surveys do you send out every year? This year, about 1,600 surveys sent, were sent out, and uh, that represented a, approximately uh, 1,400 practices across the country. So in the demographics section, I think you mentioned that you had 117 responses to this year's survey, and whereas in 2010, there were 193 responses, and in 2009, there were 208 responses. So that, that's really quite a drop. Uh, I mean, what, what do you think happened? Did, did, did you offer Borders gift cards this year instead of Starbucks gift cards? Well, no. I, w- I wish it was as easy as that, and we could say, man, let's go back to Starbucks. But uh, uh, we've speculated about, well, why is it that that's dropped off? And we have a couple of theories. One, and kind of my favorite one, is that uh, over time, our survey's just gotten to be very complex. When we, uh, when we get feedback from people that participate in the survey and others, it seems that everyone wants just a little bit more detail in the information. And so in our attempts to kind of be able to provide that, uh, we've allowed this to become quite a, quite a bulky instrument. Back when Elaine and I were involved with MGMA and AOHA, we continuously encouraged them to simplify and our mantra was it's better to have, you know, a lot of people answer 20 questions than a few people try to answer 100 questions. 
but I think we've sort of fallen on our own, uh, fallen on our own uh, advice and, fall, and not done that. So one of our intentions is to go back to our, our mantra of being simple and trying to make it much easier to do. Then the, another factor is, is that the environment that practices find themselves in today is just, it's just so much more fast-paced and pressurized than it was last year or the year before last. And certainly when compared to, you know, four or five years ago, it's just a, a difficult environment to work in. And so uh, that, that next hour that one could be doing something at the practice level, perhaps filling in a survey and participating in this survey is, is not what to, they would choose to do with that hour. So we think that those are two factors that uh, could well have given us kind of a, a fall off over these years in the number of people that participated. Sure, that, that makes sense. So uh, before we, we talk about the trends paper, which is what I want to spend most of the time on, I want to ask you about a few of the findings and some of the graphs from your primary data paper, which I, I thought were particularly interesting when I read it. For the listeners, let me just say that um, I'm referring to the paper that was published online this month um, entitled uh, National Practice Benchmark 2011 Report on 2010 Data. And you can find some of the color reproductions of the graphs in the online appendix. So this is published online and the paper copy will be coming out in November. What I was particularly interested in was some of the new questions you added this year. For example, um, you asked about pressures impacting business decisions. Uh, this is uh, figure 10 and table 1. What, what did you find there? Well, it's interesting, Dr. Miller. We, uh, we did ask that, and we were interested in particular whether there were certain drivers um, that were going to become the overwhelming response of, our res of, of the participants in the study. We asked people to rank what was driving their decisions and gave them four choices. Um, competitive pressures, just think about market competition in their particular market. Cost pressures, and that was really an all-purpose term to include drug costs, rent, staff costs, general operating costs. Payer pressures, we're hearing a lot um, in the market right now about payer pressures, and we describe that as declining reimbursement, contracting, pre-auth pre requirements, really the whole bucket of payer pressures. And then we provided a, a category for other responses. And surprisingly to me, um, each of those three primary um, responses, competitive pressures, cost pressures, and payer pressures, all got about a third of the respondents. Hmm. So there was nothing that really jumped out as being the primary driver of the of business challenges today. All three of those things seem to be equally important. That, that's interesting because I, I would have thought that payer pressures would have been ranked first, but I guess that's that may be more market dependent. I think that's true. I think in some markets, clearly, that's a bigger a bigger challenge than in others. I really thought uh, cost pressures would be the most prevalent response. Sure. So it, uh, but it was really pretty equal. So an another question that was interesting was you asked a question about how drugs are purchased or procured in the practice, and and this is in figures eleven through fifteen. Um, and you used a term I, I have to admit I'd never heard before called white bagging. So. Tell us what white bagging is and, and what, what were your findings with this question? Sure. Again, we asked practices to define um, how they, what the primary method is for them to procure drugs in their practice and, again, gave them some choices. They, those included traditional buy-in bill where the, the business entity or the practices, a practice purchases drugs and then bills payers for the drugs. We included 340B pricing on the list. That's a hot topic in lots of, lots of meetings that I'm attending right now, and that was partly the driver for this question. How big an impact does 340B pricing have? Then we asked about the impact of specialty pharmacy in two different categories. One is brown bagging, which is a term that's been around for several years, and we defined that as uh, when drugs are ordered through a specialty pharmacy or a preferred uh, pharmacy provider who delivers the drugs to the patient who then transports the drug to the office. And brown bagging, as you know, has been um, kind of a very negative term for several years. Practices don't want to, nor should they, assume risk for drugs that the patient um, ends up handling, and you're not sure whether the drugs have been properly stored. There are lots of safety issues. 
But but a newer trend is this this term called white bagging, and that's when the drugs are ordered through a specialty pharmacy and delivered directly to the practice for a particular patient. So it takes out um, some of the elements of concern about safety issues, and in some marketplaces, um, particularly in the Northeast, uh, which is where I've heard about it more um, most strongly, um, that's becoming a a big method for uh, drug distribution and drug um, preparation for practices. So we asked practices to indicate um, how how prevalent each of those models were, and not surprisingly, the largest number of respondents still use traditional, the traditional buy and bill. I see. So we had a large number of respondents who said that either 100% of their drugs or well over 90% of their drugs are procured through buy and bill. But not an insignificant number um, are also experiencing both brown bagging and this white bagging concept as far as um, a method to receive the drugs in their practice. 340B pricing in this particular survey audience that we had one practice who was completely 340B and a few practices that got a little bit of their drugs through that channel, but that's certainly not a prevalent um, method of drug distribution at this point. Just, just so we're all on the same page, could you just define what 340B pricing is for the listeners? Sure. 340B pricing is a mechanism defined by federal law uh, a number of years ago, about 15 years ago actually, where hospitals who have a disproportionate share of of, uh, needy patients, of low-income patients, Medicare, Medicaid patients, are eligible to purchase drugs at a discounted rate. Um, It was the 340B section of some Social Security standard about 15 years ago. Um, So increasingly in markets where the 340B criteria can be met, the hospitals can purchase drugs for significantly less than market rates for the outpatients who are treated in their hospital environment. There are rules that have to be met um, and certainly certain criteria to qualify, but it is increasingly um, more prevalent in the marketplace today and is one mechanism by which you see hospitals uh, bringing on or hiring medical oncologists into their facility uh, to take advantage of this 340B pricing. Physician practices are not eligible and not all hospitals are eligible for this pricing. So I also want to ask you about pathways, because you asked some questions about, are you using guidelines or clinical pathways? But I was actually um, surprised that I think it was more than, in more than 50% of cases, the source of the pathway was either the practice itself or some uh, other category. And I was, I was thinking it would, it would have been the major players, you know, U.S. Oncology and, and P4 comes to mind. So So do you think that is really what the national trend is, um, or maybe that was more an artifact of the demographics of of the practices that answered your survey? What do you you think? Well, that's actually a great question. um, One of our goals in asking the question the way we did this year was, first of all, to see if practices were really distinguishing between practice guidelines and clinical pathways. So we provided a definition for each and asked two very specific separate questions about whether they use... Uh, practice guidelines, which almost everybody said yes, and clinical pathways, which fewer people said yes. And then we explored the the clinical pathway track, as you said, and I was a little surprised as well that the numbers were fairly small for practices that that actually use the, the clinical pathways that are most prevalent, we believe, in the marketplace today, which P4, UPMC, or VIA Oncology, and uh, the U.S. Oncology Pathways I guess I'm not terribly surprised. We haven't heard, I haven't heard, a lot of success stories about clinical pathways and reimbursement mechanisms and payers recognizing clinical pathways. Um, So I I think until that happens, there's not a lot of impetus or reason for practices to really embrace, embrace pathways. I was gratified that so many practices said that they had developed some sort of mechanism within their practice, so at least people are thinking a little more along those lines. But until the payers really embrace the models, I'm not sure how much more traction we'll see. Yeah, it sounds like we've we've been hearing that for, gosh, years. I mean, I remembered that in my previous life. You start using clinical pathways and, you know, you're going to have the payers eating out of your hand. So I I guess that's not, it's not really happening anywhere yet. Let me move on to the, uh, your primary trends analysis paper, and uh, which was a, a very interesting um, assessment of, of about the last five or six years of, of this and, you know, using your data. 
And l let me let me turn to Tom. So so you you and Elaine you divide the literally the past twenty years of oncology practice into these different eras or different phases. There were three different eras you defined based on economic conditions and sort of the overall practice environment. So walk us through that. What were the phases? What factors contributed to these transitions? The phases are sort of self-revealed when you plot the data points that, are, that we've looked at here. And these include the uh, total medical revenue coming into a practice, the total operating costs for the practice, and the medical and surgical supplies that are purchased by the practice. And we look at those three data points per FTE medical oncologist. So when you plot that out from 1991 to 2010, the data gets to, to really sort of sort itself into these three different, uh, different buckets. I imagine if we look at it again in 10 years, we may want to resort it, but this is the way it looks today. From 2005, really up to about, oh, I don't know, 2003, maybe 2004, the marketplace uh, as revealed in this data was just characterized by its stability. That is a nice, steady, year-by-year -year increase in both the total medical revenue and in the, the cost of goods, the drugs that were purchased and used in the practice, and a diverging line between the total medical revenue and the, uh, the uh, total operating costs. And when those two lines diverge, then you have uh, uh, a profitable business. That is, it's uh, spinning off more money than it's consuming. And so that leads to the ability to be able to make investments, to, uh, to grow, to extend service lines, to do, do lots of things that uh, one would choose to do for the benefit of, of their patients. Then uh, we see sort of the next, the data starts to get really interesting. In fact, we see that in 2004, which is uh, coincidentally, or maybe not, Medicare uh, modernization, suddenly the cost of goods paid for that is the drugs, the medical supplies, uh, our infusion products, really starts to grow very rapidly. And instead of looking like a linear progression from year to year, it starts to look exponential. So there's a lot of new uh, or more drugs and therapies being purchased per medical oncologist. And the top line, the medical revenue that's coming in from those things, it also takes a nice jump upwards, but not as fast. So we start to see then that the middle line in there, that is the total operating cost, rather than diverging, getting further away from the total medical revenue, starts to creep up there and looks like it's going to run into that. Then, so that Medicare modernization, and then the, the third component of this, the third section, we call this the squeeze. Oh, I love that name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a, when you look at the data, it's sort of self-revealing. In, in that year, we see really for the first time since we started looking at this data in 1991 that the total cost uh, per doctor that the doctor is actually buying for, for the drugs and therapies, uh, it drops and it goes down dramatically. So they're spending less money now for drugs and, and for the therapies that are being used. And sort of counterintuitively, the total medical revenue goes up in that year and in the following year. So those are sort of the precursors to what we see now happening in 2009 and then again in 2010. In 2009, the total medical revenue dropped substantially for medical oncologists. And the, the costs for medical oncologists dropped as well, but not as much. So now when we say the squeeze, the two lines representing total medical revenue and total operating cost are getting dangerously close together. Sure. When I say dangerously close, when those lines touch, then there, there, is, no, uh, there is no profitability. There's no, no money left over to, to do things with. In 2011, we again see now for the second time since 1991 that, again, the total spend per full-time medical oncologist drops yet again. And, and then our total cost does come down again, but again, not really keeping pace with the fall in total medical revenue. So we see that as we look in this period of the squeeze, that the, the free money, the free cash that's left over 
that's being produced out of these oncology practices is diminishing, it's declining. Uh, when we earlier asked in the survey, what are the, you know, what are the things that keep you up at night? What are your worries? And people talked about cost. They talked about payers, talked about market pressures. Those are all the things one talks about and worries about when you're in the squeeze, when there's less marginal revenue left over after paying the bills to be able to, to invest back into, into the practice. So when we look at this data, it really does sort itself out into these three buckets quite nicely. It makes you long for those good old days when you could predict what was going to happen in this year by looking at last year. And we see in the period from 2004 until 2010 that that ability to make predictions about next year based on last year is increasingly difficult, increasingly problematic. Not that different from the rest of our economy, really, when you think about it. One of the things I want to ask you, you talk about the role that uh, ESAs played in all this. Now, it's no secret that ESAs were certainly a a source of of, uh, revenue for practices uh, back in the heyday. But do you think that's just the tip of the iceberg, or was that really a fundamental uh, issue that led to some of these figures? I think it's probably uh, both. That is, I think it is a fundamental figure in that it was uh, it represented a substantial loss of margin for these practices. And so I think it really is kind of a turning point. But to your question, it's also the tip of the iceberg in the sense that it really starts to reveal and and actualize what MMA was all about. And MMA, I mean, to my way of thinking, is about taking the uh, the margin out of the oncology practice on drugs. Plenty of discussion about whether that's the right thing or the wrong thing to do, but from an economic point of view, it's clearly a perverse incentive. Whether it actually you know operates that way in the clinic is is open for debate. But uh, there's no doubt that that was one of the goals of of Medicare reform was to was to get that margin out of there and moving to uh, the ASP model from the AWP model has certainly accomplished that. Yeah, that's what happens. It's driving that margin out. So you, you talk a little bit about the future. You, you, you made some predictions. So I want to I read those just so everyone is on the same page. So let me just read these four predictions you made quickly. Um, prediction one, the squeeze persists. Prediction two, pace of continued efficiency improvement falters. Prediction three, service delivery per FTE Hemonc peaks. And prediction four, labor costs to increase faster than revenue. So, uh, you know, I don't think uh, any practicing oncologists are going to feel very warm and fuzzy after reading your predictions here. So, but I want to ask you in your, in your report last year, the one thing that really struck me when we talked last year was that, you know, clearly practices were facing some of these same pressures, but you and Elaine were um, pleasantly surprised, I think it's fair to say, that uh, practices still seem to be pretty resilient, and they increased volume of patients seen and so forth. They were nimble enough to make changes that would enhance their survival. What what do you think this year? Do you you think that still applies this year, or is this the, once again, the beginning of the end we keep talking about? Well, I I think that, uh, just call it the beginning of the end, I think it's probably the beginning of the end of this era. Okay. That is the era when practices really are built on that margin on drugs. I think that is that is true. And what we've seen in the past is that practices really have been remarkably uh, successful at finding ways to become more efficient to actually reduce the amount of operating capital through inventory reduction or through accelerated payment collections to, to get – their business is more lean. Uh, And and I think that's a good thing. And I expect that we'll see practices that are able to do that uh, in the future. But as we sort of look back on the time when when, uh, infusion and uh, medical oncology came out of the hospital and into the private practice setting and the uh, distributors, you know, sort of arose and that whole business model uh, replaced the infusions that took place in the hospital that was a, a change in, the, in really the market structure. And I think we're probably going to be looking at a change in the market structure again, another change. Uh, I'm careful to, you know, you say it won't make oncologists warm and fuzzy. I think you, you're, you're right to the degree that they cling to or that any of us cling to 
the old methodologies, the old technologies of doing things. They're just not likely to work uh, for a long period of time as we, as we gaze into the future. And again, not just in oncology, but in, in all of medicine and in fact in, in the general economy. So I think that it, it may well be the end of sort of oncology as we think about it and know it today, but it certainly isn't the end of oncology. Uh, we clearly know that, uh, that these services will still be demanded and they'll still be provided. It's just what is the business model and what is the revenue engine that will, that will drive that? Uh, this is the first time we've ever made predictions uh, into the future. Oh, that's, I didn't know that. I didn't realize yeah, that. We, we yeah, we tend to be sort yeah. of skittish about that. Sure. One of my, one of my favorite uh, quotes is, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. That's from Yogi Berra. And, our, and the data really, it, it's, I mean, it's great. It looks good, but it, it's, uh, it's got a lot of issues that would cause anybody that's making predictions about the future to be somewhat uh, skittish about really doing that. However, I think it is useful to do it. It's useful to, to think about that and to start to look ahead and look for what that next paradigm is, what that next business model is, and to recognize that, uh, you know, the old one, it's just tired. It's just not going to get us there. So are you guys going to keep doing these surveys? Uh, do, you, do you have any plans for another survey next year, Elaine? We do, actually. We, we expect to continue doing these surveys. We, we want to stay nimble, stay um, abreast of market changes. And one of the things that we think we need to do and we're working on now, actually, is, is uh, developing a tool that is, is more applicable to a broader audience. And by that, I mean not really just focused on physician-owned practices, but also can accommodate information and meaningful data from hospital-based practices, perhaps academics, but certainly hospital-based practices. Mm -hmm. So we're working now on developing a data set. Hospitals are more limited, in, particularly in the financial data that they can provide from, the, from within the cancer program. So we're really working on kind of gearing up for that marketplace in a more productivity-driven uh, survey instrument. As Tom mentioned early in the, in the comments, um, we really feel like we have to make this, the survey simpler, try and uh, pare down the number of questions and make it a little less onerous for practices to, to respond to, and that's one of our goals. We, we kind of say that every year, and we haven't been super successful, but I think that the fall-off in respondents really is going to drive that. And the other thing that we're really, and this ties to my first comment, really starting to focus on more is relative value units as, as a productivity measure. Um, they're increasingly important in the marketplace, particularly as practices and, and hospitals start working together closer. So we're trying to come up with mechanisms and we're working on developing tools where we can look at having practices report at least the work component of their relative value units and use that to develop uh, some productivity measures that will be helpful to practices in whatever work environment they find themselves. Well, that's great information. So I want to say a very special thanks to my guests, Tom Barr and Elaine Toll, for sharing your work with us on this highly relevant and timely topic. I'm looking forward to doing this again with you guys next September. I'm looking forward to it as well. It'll be a pleasure. Yeah, me too. More data, more fun. And to remind our listeners, uh, both of Tom's and Elaine's papers are available online right now at jop.ascopubs.org. And you can read the Trends Manuscript in your paper issue of the September JOP, which should be in your mailbox. Plus, don't miss our other great articles about the state of oncology practice in the September issue. And don't forget to send your comments and suggestions about these podcasts to JOP Editor's Desk at ASCO.org or comment in iTunes. This is Dr. Bob Miller for the American Society of Clinical Oncology. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>